how many of you have a package of Band-Aids at home? Okay. How many of you need a Band-Aid right now? I brought some extra ones. You can come on up and get one if you need one. Sure, just in case. Anybody else need a Band-Aid right now? Come on up, pick one up. Sure, sure. Here's one for you. Anybody else need a Band-Aid? All right. They got some more there. You kids don't need one. You're just raising your hand. All right. <laughs> Why is it that almost every one of you have a Band-Aid at home, but you're not using it now? Why is that? Because you don't need it right now, right? But might you need a Band-Aid sometime? You may need one sometime, right? But some people need them right now, right? My sermon today on the guidance of God is like a Band-Aid. Every single one of you will need the principles that we present today sometime in your life. But there is somebody here today that needs a Band-Aid right now. Somebody here today is going to walk out of this meeting today totally different. Because you've come here needing direction. You've come here needing the guidance of God. And God's going to speak to your heart today and put a Band-Aid on your soul. And you're going to know the direction to go. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we've come to open your word. We've come to study your book. We've come to get guidance from the living word of God. So speak to us through your word today. The hour of earth's history is late. There are multiple voices around us that are leading us in various directions. But we want to hear the voice of God today. So come and speak to our hearts, I pray. In Christ's name, amen. It was a quiet Sunday morning in Thousand Oaks, California. I was the speaker of It Is Written television program, and so as the result of that, Tini and I and our family lived in a gated community. Because many people who watched us on television would want to come and visit me, and many of them came uninvited. And so on this particular day, as I was sitting relaxing on a Sunday morning, the guard at the gate called and he said, Pastor Finley, there's somebody here to see you. I said, well, what's the name of the individual? I didn't know if it was one of our friends to come to see us or not. He gave me the name, and it was a person that I had never heard of before. And the guard at the gate said, this man is really insistent. He says that he has to see you, and he has to see you right now. He wants the address of your house. He wants to come to your house. So I said, well, you keep him at the gate. I will come down to see him. Coming to the gate, I didn't recognize the man. And the man said to me, Pastor Finley, I have been praying about this, and I have a real conviction. And the conviction is that I should leave my wife, I should leave my family, I've traveled 500 miles from Northern California, and I should come and work with you on your It Is Written staff and travel all over the world with you. Pastor Finley, I've been praying about it. Pastor Finley, that's my conviction that I need to travel the world with you, for, with you. That's what God impressed me. I said, now my brother, where's your wife today? Well, she's back in the apartment. Does she have any source of income? No pastor, none at all. I said, you know what, brother? The Lord just impressed me with something. Get on the bus and go back and see your wife. <laughs> go back and take care of her. He said, I don't have any bus fare. I said, I'll tell you what to do. I'm gonna get you a hotel tonight. I'll put your hotel on my credit card. And uh, do you have any money? Well, I, I just have a little bit. Yeah, I got enough of your bus fare. Yeah, I think I could do that if you got me a hotel. Now look, brother, because you think God impressed you with something doesn't necessarily mean that God impressed you with something. Do you think the Lord impressed this man to leave his wife and children and come travel the world with me? You think he impressed him to do that? Although he was convicted that he ought to do something, did that make the thing he wanted to do the will of God? Our impressions always a safe guide. What about convictions of conscience? When a person says to you, I'm really convicted that this is what God wants me to do. Is that always a safe path? How does God guide us? 
How do we discern the will of God? How do we separate our own feelings of what we think God's will is to knowing what God's will is? Seven principles for discerning God's guidance and knowing God's voice. If you're taking notes, you're going to write this down. This is going to be like the Band-Aid that you're going to want to put in the medicine cabinet of your mind so that when you need it, you can take it out. But there's somebody here today that's seeking the guidance of God. Somebody here today that's looking for the voice of God to speak to their heart. And God's going to speak to you. Seven eternal principles that we find in Scripture that reveal to us how to discern God's voice and the guidance of God. Here's the first principle. Read the promises of God on his guidance and believe he desires to guide you. Here is the incredible good news. God wants to guide us in making right decisions more than we want to be guided. When you're confused, perplexed, and wondering what to do in any given situation, Fill your mind with the promises of God. The matter may be a small one. The matter may be a large one. But whether it's a financial decision, a decision regarding your children, a decision regarding some aspect of family life, a decision about how to best serve God or where to live, here are three promises for you. Fill your mind with the promises of God. Psalm 32, verse 8. What is the benefit of filling our mind with the promises of God? When we fill our mind with the promises of God, it gives us confidence that God's going to do what he says in our behalf and guide us. So the first step in being guided by God is filling your mind with the promises of God that leads you to have a confidence in the ability of God to guide you. Psalm 32, verse 8. You ready to read, church? I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I will guide you with mine eye. Who was saying that to David? Who was saying that? God was saying that. And what does God promise? I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I'll guide you with my eye. Isaiah, chapter 58 and verse 11. Isaiah 58 and verse 11. Notice the text. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your soul in drought. He'll strengthen your bones. You'll be like a watered garden, like a spring of water. His waters do not fail. The Lord is going to guide you continually. And the scripture says here, he'll satisfy your soul in drought. So when you feel confused, you feel perplexed, you don't know what to do, the promise of God speaks to our hearts. Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6. Promise after promise in the Bible. We are not specks of cosmic dust living on an earth that has no savior that holds this world in its hands, that has no creator. The promises of God are for you and me. When you are perplexed, when you wonder what to do, when the decision before you seems to be confusing, allow the promises of God to give you guidance, the promises of God to give you encouragement. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. Notice the promise of God. Trust in the Lord. Don't lean on your own understanding, your own impressions. We need not simply guidance, but we need a guide. Not only guidance, but we need a guide. Trusting in the Lord with all of our heart. Acknowledging him. So the first principle of divine guidance that you find in Scripture is to fill your mind with the promises of God and allow God's word to bring you into a confident relationship with Jesus, 
knowing that he will fulfill his promises. Now, the second principle of divine guidance is ask God for guidance. Believe he's going to guide you. Now, notice what Isaiah says in Isaiah 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. The government will be on his shoulder. He'll be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government, there shall be no end. Now, notice the text, what it says. Who is this child that is to be born? Who is this an obvious prediction about? Who is it a prediction about? Who is it? Jesus. Jesus. Now, what does it say? Who is this child born to? For unto what? Us a child is born. Who is this son given to, everybody? Unto what? Us the son is given. He came to earth for us. He lived for us. He died for us. He ministers in heaven for us. He's coming again for us. And what is Jesus called in this text? What is he called in the text? He's the wonderful what? Counselor. And who is he to give counsel to? To us. Look at Isaiah 11, verse 2. Jesus is a wonderful counselor. There is no better counselor than Jesus. Why is Jesus such a wonderful counselor? Because there are seven things about Jesus that are given to us in Isaiah 11 too. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. That's upon Jesus. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and might. The spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Look, I may not have wisdom, but Jesus does. I may not have understanding, but Jesus does. I may not have adequate counsel, but Jesus can give it to me. I may not have the strength to carry out the wisdom that he gives, but he has might. I may not have knowledge, but he does. And I may not have the fear of the Lord that leads me to him, but he does. Notice, for unto us a son is given. Unto us a child is born. His name shall be called, what everybody? Wonderful, wonderful what? Counselor. Is Jesus a wonderful counselor to you? Notice what it says in Colossians 2, verse 3, 2 and 3. Colossians 2, verse 2, verse 3. Where, are the, where is the wisdom of the ages found? We often live on the husks of human wisdom. We, we live on the breadcrumbs of human understanding. When there is a fountain of knowledge for us in Christ. Colossians chapter 2. Reading there, verse 2 and 3. That their hearts be encouraged, being knit together. Colossians 2, verse 2. In love and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding. To the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and Christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So in Christ, we find the, all the hidden treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So coming to Jesus, we say, Jesus, in you are the hidden treasures of wisdom that I do not have to make this decision. But I know in coming to you, you have promised that you'd guide me. You long to guide me. Since Jesus is the, the knowledge of all wisdom and the fountain of all knowledge, he's able to guide us in each decision we make. When the path seems uncertain, he is our certainty. When the way is dark, he is our light. When we are insecure, he is our security. It's not simply guidance we need, it is a what? A guide. When we're confused about what decision to make, Jesus, our wonderful counselor, will show us the way. Now listen. There's a difference between wisdom and knowledge. Knowledge is the ability to ascertain facts. But wisdom is the ability to know how to use those facts. So you may have knowledge about something, but you need the wisdom from God to apply that knowledge in your given situation. I love what one author says. He says, through his wisdom, God applies his knowledge to accomplish his purposes 
in ways which will bring the greatest good to us and the most glory to him. So look, through God's wisdom, we come to God for wisdom. And through his wisdom, God applies his knowledge to accomplish his purposes in ways that will bring the greatest good to, to mankind and to us and to the most glory to him. That's Dr. Robert Leitner. So when we come to God for wisdom, he is going to share with us from the mysteries of eternity, from the abundance of his knowledge, the direction that he wants our personal lives to take. And as he does that, we have wisdom not only to know what to do, but we have the knowledge to do it. I love what Ellen White says in the book, great, in the book Christ's Object Lessons, page 146. So let's look at uh, Christ's Object Lessons, page 146. Can you read it with me, please? Join me. You need not go to the ends of the earth for wisdom, for God is near. Isn't that good news? I don't need to go to the ends of the earth for wisdom. Why not, everybody? Where's God? Where is he? He's near. You need not go to the ends of the earth for wisdom, for God is near. It is not the capabilities you now possess. Well, I read it too fast. Let's go back and get it. It is not the capabilities you now possess or ever will have that will give you success. It is that which the Lord can do for you. We need to have far less confidence in what man can do and far more confidence in what God can do for every believing soul. Second principle of guidance is this. We believe in the promises of God that he will guide us. Secondly, now notice the way I phrase that. I did not say we believe in the promises of God that he can guide us. Is there a difference between believing in the promises of God that he can guide us and believing in the promises of God that he will guide us? Is there a difference in that? It's one thing for a person to say, oh, I, I think God can guide me, sure, in some kind of vague, shadowy way. But when I come to that crucible of decision, and I'm at the crossroads of decision, it's one thing to believe that God can guide me, but it's another thing to believe that he is present in my life, active in my life, and from the wisdom of the fountain of eternal wisdom from the ages, that he will guide me at that moment to have confidence in what he can do. Jeremiah 33, verse 3, puts it this way. Call on me, and I will show you, what? Great and mighty things you do not know. In the crucible of decision, we can open our hearts and call on him. And he's going to show us great and mighty things. We can pray with the psalmist in Psalm 27, and verse 11. Psalm 27, 11 puts it this way. Teach me your way, O Lord. So we come to God not with our own understanding. We come to God not telling God what we want him to do for us. We come to God with this humility, with these open hearts and, and, and open minds. And we come to God. And at times, the answer does not come immediately. So when you're seeking God for guidance, do not always expect a lightning strike out of the blue to get immediate answers. Because often God allows us to wait so that we develop patience, we develop faith, we develop trust, we are drawn closer to him. Psalm 27 verse 14 is a very similar passage. It says, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he'll strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. So look, wait on the Lord. You find that again and again in the Psalms, David is saying, wait on the Lord. Don't get discouraged if the answer for guidance doesn't come quickly. Don't get discouraged if, if you seem not to see any light on the road ahead. What does the text say? Let's read the text, everybody. Psalm 27, 14, reading together. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. There's an author called J.I. Packer, and Packer made an interesting statement uh, in a book called Knowing God. He says this, wait on the Lord 
is a constant refrain in the Psalms, and it is. It's, nece it's a necessary word for God, often keeps us waiting. He is not in such a hurry as we are, and it's not his way to give more light on the future than we need for action in the present, or to guide us more than one step at a time. So when we wait on the Lord, it doesn't mean we wait in, act in activity. It doesn't mean we wait and do nothing. It means when God gives us a little light, we walk in the light that he gives us, knowing that more light will come. How many of you drove a car here today? You drove a car here, okay? A good number of you. How many rode in a car here today? So let's suppose you're visiting a friend back in the countryside of West Virginia. And I mean, you're way back in the country. I mean, there are no houses around for 10 miles except your friend's cabin. And you visited with your friend all day and you've had a wonderful visit. And now it's at night and it's dark, 10 o'clock at night. And you get in your car to drive home. How far do the bright beams, now there's no street lights on this dirt road, okay? You got the picture. You got the picture in your mind. You're in a cabin. You're way back in the woods, West Virginia, way back there. It's dark. The moon is not even shining at night. There's no street lights there. You got the picture? It's dark. You get in your car. How far does, do your bright beams shine? 350 to 400 feet. I looked it up because I knew someone was going to ask me about it after the sermon. 350 to 400 feet. That's how far they shine. You're in your car, no street lights. You got to drive 10 miles down this dirt road. It's pitch black, and the light shines 350 feet up in front, 400 feet. I'm not going with you. I'll tell you why I'm not riding in your car. Because 600 feet up there, it's dark. 700 feet up there, it's dark. A mile up there, it's dark. Why would I get in your car with a light that's just shining 350 to 400 feet when 600 feet it's dark, 700 feet it's dark, and a mile up there is dark? Why? Because when you get there, there's going to be light. Because when you go there, if you keep taking that next, drive that next 10 feet or 15 feet or 20 feet, it's going to be light up there, right? Do what you know to be right today even if you don't know what you're supposed to do tomorrow. And if you make the best decisions under the guidance of the Spirit of God today, light will shine on your path tomorrow. That leads us to this amazing statement in Testimonies, Volume 5, page 199. Testimonies, Volume 5, page 199. The visible and the invisible world are in close contact. There is a battle between Christ and Satan in our world. Could the veil be lifted? We would see evil angels pressing their darkness around us and working with all their power to deceive and destroy. Every angel in heaven wants you to make the right decision. And every angel in hell wants you to make the wrong decision. There's a battle. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, against principalities and powers, darkness. So notice... Wicked men are surrounded, influenced, and aided by evil spirits. But the man or woman of faith and prayer has yielded his soul to divine guidance, and angels of God bring to him light and strength from heaven. When we submit ourselves to God in faith and prayer, and we yield our soul to divine guidance, the angels of heaven will beat back the powers of hell and light will come. Walk in the light you have, trusting that God will give you more light at the time you need it. Principle number three. First principle, fill your mind with the promises of God. You'll have more confidence in him and his ability to guide. Principle number two. Believe that he wants to guide you and believe he will guide you and walk in the light you have. Principle number three, 
Search the word to be sure your decision you're making is in harmony with the word of God. The Holy Spirit will never lead us to do something that is contrary to the word of God. Seek the will of the Spirit in connection with the Word of God. See, the Spirit and the Word must be combined. Because if you simply depend on the Spirit without the Word, you uh, can become subject to great delusions. If the Holy Spirit guides us at all, He's going to do it according to the Scriptures, never contrary to them. There's a fascinating passage in Psalm 25, verse 4 and 5. Psalm 25, verse 4 and 5. There's a fascinating passage here that links the guidance of God to the truth of God. Psalm 25, verse 4 and verse 5. David is praying. He desperately needs to know the way and will of God. Psalm 25, verse 4 and 5. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. So David is praying for guidance. He's saying, Lord, I want to know your way. I don't want to have my own will. Teach me your paths. Now notice the next phrase. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the way of my salvation. So we are guided by God as we say to God, God, I don't want to do anything that's not in harmony with your will. Lord, when it comes to a decision about finances, I'm going to study what the Bible says about debt. I'm going to study what the Bible says about expending my money. And God, I only want to do your will. Guide me. When it comes about principles of relationships, Lord, I want to have the best possible relationship with every person within my sphere of influence. And if there have been some broken relationships, I cannot pray for God's guidance unless I repair those relationships. Because... I can't say, well, God, that's the other person's responsibility. No. If there are broken relationships, I say, God, I want you to change me with inside to repair that relationship so the broken relationship is healed. You see, we pray for the guidance of God, but we pray for the guidance of God in harmony with biblical principles. If you're having challenges with your marriage, the solution to that challenge is to seek God, ask him for guidance with the principles of Scripture and make a decision to live in harmony with the principles of Scripture. If I'm, if I'm wanting guidance in where to live, whatever decision I make, now not every specific decision you're going to find in the Bible, but you are going to find principles that are going to guide you in those specifics, surrendering the will to the will of God and asking God through his word to guide you is the key in proper decision making. It kind of reminds me of a funny story I read about an old Scottish woman. This old Scottish woman, she sold buttons and yarn, you know, in Scotland. And so she would go from little village to little village to little village selling these buttons and yarn, go door to door, house to house. And she had an interesting thing. When she went to a certain road, she'd come to a crossroad and she had a stick and she'd throw the stick up in the air and wherever the stick pointed, if it pointed right, she would go down that road and she'd say, ah, that's the way that I must, destiny wants me to go. That's the way that providence wants me to go. Then she'd go over to the next road, throw the stick off. If the stick went with left, that's the way that she wanted to go. She wanted to go left. Well, one day she's in the front of this road, standing there kind of perplexed. There are two roads. She keeps throwing the stick up, two, keeps going left. Throws the stick up again, keeps going left. Throws the stick up again, keeps going left. And somebody comes along and says, why do you keep throwing that stick? She said, because the stick's not pointing the way I want to go. <laughs> now look, if you come to God and say, all right, God, give me answers to my prayers in the way I want the stick to fall. You got the point? See, when I come to God, here's a biblical principle. We come to God, and we say, God, my mind is subject to your word. Give me directions from your word on the principles and reveal to me 
the way that you want me to go. Elizabeth Elliot wrote a book called The Quest for Love, and she made an interesting statement in that book. And here's what she says. Does it make sense to pray for guidance about the future if we're not obeying in the very thing that lies before us? How many momentous events in Scripture depended on one person's seemingly small act of obedience? Rest assured, now don't miss this one, do what God tells you to do now and depend on it, and you'll be shown what to do next. I love what Ellen White says in Desire of Ages, page 667 and 668. Tremendous principle of guidance. Let's read it together. Those who decide to do nothing in any line that will displease God will know after pursuing their case before him just what course to pursue. They will receive not only wisdom, but strength, power for obedience, for service, will be imparted to them as Christ has promised. Now notice the certainty of this. When in your heart you decide to do nothing in any line that will displease God, you will know when you present your case before him exactly what to do. First three principles. Number one, fill your mind with the promises of God's word. It will build confidence. Number two, believe he's, no, he's going to act in your behalf. He's going to guide you. Number three, make a decision in your life that you're not going to do anything out of harmony with his word. Number four, seek godly counsel. Now, it doesn't, I don't say seek counsel. Seek what kind of counsel? Godly counsel. Now, notice this passage, and I need to unpack this for you for a little bit. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 14. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 14. Where there is no counsel, the people fall. In other words, people run headlong to make some decision that they feel impressed about, and they're not willing to listen to anybody else. So where there is no counsel, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there's what? There's safety. Now, the sure sign of a poor counselor is somebody you go to, and they tell you exactly what you want to hear. Because that doesn't help you at all. Counselors also are to guide you in the decision-making process. But never, never surrender your free will to another. So you become so dependent on them that you can't make a decision on your own. Godly counselors always will present you options. They'll always make suggestions. But they'll leave the ultimate decision to the one they're counseling. Godly counselors help us to see things from a different perspective. They give us a larger, more comprehensive view. They present the pros and cons, but they leave you to pray about it. Do you have a few people that you can share the challenges of life with and ask for guidance? Now, notice what the Bible says. The Bible does not say there is safety in a counselor. You missed it. The Bible does not say there is safety in a counselor. What does it say? There is safety in what? A multitude of counselors. A multitude must be more than one, right? What is the danger of having one person that you go to and seek for counsel in your major decisions? Yeah, they could be wrong. But you can become so codependent on that person that they become a substitute God for you and you don't even realize it. You can become so dependent on your counselor that they become for you the substitute voice of God. The reason we need more than one counsel, I have about three or four people in my life that are really, to me, I trust them implicitly. They're men of great wisdom and godly. I have a track record with them for about 30 years. And when there are critical decisions... I know that they will be honest with me. I know they'll slap me up the side of the head if I need to be slapped. And I listen to them. Now, if one of them gives me certain counsel to go in this direction, and the other three are leaning in this direction, see, if you have only one person that you're counseling with, you can be shaped and molded by that person's opinion. That's why the Bible says there is safety in what? There's safety in what, everybody? 
a multitude of counselors. God himself does not desire that any individual overshadows God's will for you and unknowingly shapes your decision and what they want you to do and not what God wants you to do. Find a few godly people in your life, people of prayer, people of faith, people of wisdom, that you can trust with the major decisions of your life and open your heart to them. But then, after getting their counsel, pray about that. Fifth principle, look for the providences of God. In any decision you've got to make in life, look for the providences of God. Now, what are the providences of God? The providences of God are activities that God works to open doors of opportunity for you. Now, you're not going to see all seven of these principles all at once necessarily. Sometimes I'm praying about something, and I'm quoting the promises of God, and sometimes I'm seeking the Bible. Sometimes I get major decision from a counselor, and I move. I don't see the providences. But other times, you're talking to counselors, and it's kind of ambivalent. It's kind of... Um, and it's kind of like fuzzy. And God will open some door of providence, and you say, I got to move. I got to act on this. God opened a door. Here's the scriptural principle Proverbs 23, verse 26. Proverbs 23, verse 26. Are you getting these band aids in your, going to put them in your medicine cabinet? Proverbs 23, verse 26. Here it is. My son, oh, I love that. My son, my daughter. God calls you his son. God calls you his daughter. Give me your heart and let your eyes observe my ways. What does it mean, let your eyes observe my ways? Watch what I'm doing in your life. Watch what I'm doing before you. My son, observe my ways. And uh, look for the providences of God. Seeking God's providences simply means carefully observing prayerfully the doors God is opening in any given situation and by his grace walking through them. It's trying to discover which way God is moving and moving with us. You know, there are times that we may not see the providences of God until later and we look back on the experience and we see God is working, I think heaven is going to be an incredible place. And one of the reasons for that is God's going to sit down with us and he say, you know what? These were providences I was opening up in your life. I read a story about Ira Sankey uh, shortly ago. And uh, Ira Sankey, if you remember the name, Sankey was the singing evangelist for Dwight L. Moody. I love reading evangelist stories. You would expect that. And it was Christmas Eve, 1875. And Ira Sankey is on a steamboat called the Delaware Steamboat, and he's traveling. And uh, as he's on that steamboat, it's Christmas Eve now, and the people gather around him, and his picture's been in the paper because he's sung with uh, Dwight Moody. And uh, as his picture's in the paper, some of the people see him, and they say, Brother Sankey, it's Christmas Eve. Will you sing us a song? And so Sankey gets out an old hymnal, and he looks up the song, Savior, Like a Shepherd, Lead Us. And he begins to sing, Savior, Like a Shepherd, Lead Us. Much we need thy tenderest care. In thy pleasant pastures feed us, for our use thy folds prepare. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus. He goes to the second verse, we are thine, do thou befriend us, be our guardian of our way. He finishes the song. A man steps out of the darkness and looks at Sankey, and he says, I have a question for you. Did you ever serve, now remember this is 1875, did you ever serve in the um, Union Army? I did. What years did you serve? 1860 to 1862. He said, I want to ask you something about 1862. Were you on guard duty in such and such a place? Thank you, said, I, I was. I was on guard duty. The man said, look, I was a Confederate soldier at that time. 
I saw you on guard duty. The moon illuminated your face, so I know it's you. I took my musket and aimed, and I was going to kill you. But you began to sing a song, and that song was the same song you sang tonight. And on guard duty, you sang that song, Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. Much we need thy tenderest care. You came to the second verse. We are thine, do thou befriend us. Be the guardian of our way. When I was a little child, my mother put me on her knee, and she sang that song to me. I could not shoot. I put down the rifle. You live today because... You sang that song. The providence of God saved that man's life. As I am seeking guidance from God, I look for his providences. But I recognize that it's going to be many, many times that I don't see those providences. And someday in a land called heaven. Someday in a place called eternity. Someday on streets of gold. Someday, sitting at the tree of life with Jesus and the angels, my guardian angel is going to come to me and say, let me share with you some of the providences of God, how I protected you, how I was with you every moment. What does Proverbs 23, verse 26 say? My son, give me your heart and let your eyes observe my ways. I want today to know and understand the providences of God in my life. But I recognize I'll never fully understand those until heaven. Now look, sometimes God's ways may not be immediately obvious to us. Sometimes God's ways may even frustrate us. Sometimes Satan's going to work to hinder the decision that God wants us to make. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 18. Satan is the great hinderer. Satan is the great what, everybody? The great hinderer. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. We're looking at there, at verse 18. Paul is praying for God's guidance. Paul desires that he go back to the church at Thessalonica to minister to them. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 18. But notice what Paul says. Therefore, we wanted to come to you. He says, I wanted to come to you. I'm seeking God to guide me back to be with you, to preach the gospel. I, even I, Paul, time and time again, but Satan hindered us. The obstacles that Satan puts in our way need not dismay us. God permits them to delay or deter us for a time, only to test our patience and faith. And the satanic hinderer will be met by the divine helper. The satanic hinderer will be met by the divine helper who will sweep away all his obstacles with the breath of his mouth. George Mueller was a great man of faith. And this is what Mueller said one day. He said, when waiting and wishing only to know and do God's will, hindrances will have no anxiety. See, sometimes we're seeking God's will. We, we, we've claimed the promises of God. We prayed about it. We've studied the word about it. We, 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 we've looked for, for, for the providences, but things don't seem to be quite clear to us. We're waiting. We're wishing to know God's will. But notice what Mueller says. Hindrances are going to give no anxiety, but a sort of pleasure. I read that, I said, what are you talking about? I'm praying, I want action now. But Mueller says, no, hindrances, hindrances can give you a sort of pleasure. Why? As affording a new opportunity for divine imposition. In other words, if I'm praying about something, seeking God's guidance, and I don't get that guidance immediately, but I continue to pray, I am then on the verge of God doing something amazing and I'm waiting for divine interposition. If it is the pillar of God we're following, Mueller says, the Red Sea will not dismay us. 
for it will furnish but another scene for the display of the power of him who can make the waters to stand up as a heap and to become a wall around us as we go through the sea on the dry ground. Somebody here today, you're praying for God's guidance. Somebody here today, you're praying that God will lead you. Somebody here today, the path is not real clear before you. The, the, the future is not real clear. And you've been praying, but you see these hindrances. That is just because God wants to do something special. It's just because God wants to work mightily in your life. It is he's developing a patience in your heart. He's developing a perseverance in your heart. He's enabling you to be ready for the miracle that he's going to work in your life. You say, is that miracle going to be the very thing I want? Not necessarily. Mueller goes on. He said, I had a secret satisfaction in the greatness of the difficulties were in the way. So far from being cast down on account of them, they delighted my soul. Now listen, for I only desired to do the will of God in this matter. I only desire to do the will of God. So when I am praying for something, it doesn't mean that God is going to do the thing necessarily I'm praying for. But if I am surrendered to the will of God, I know he's going to work in a way that's far beyond my imagination. And the ultimate thing that he does for me is going to be greater than the thing I ultimately desired. Now, here is a another secret of divine guidance. When we trust completely in Jesus and make his will our delight, we have peace in advance. And that settles a thousand, a thousand perplexing questions. Principle number six. In the decision getting process, in the decision making process, consider your options. What are the liabilities if I make this decision? What are the benefits in making it? The text is James 1 verse 5. You know it well. In every decision, we are looking at our options. God has given us a mind. And we're saying, Lord, I'm seeking your will. I'm getting godly counsel. I'm looking for the providences of God. I'm trusting your promises. But God, you have given me a mind. You don't check your brains at the door when you become a Christian. You've given me a mind. I'm not using my mind independent from God. I'm not using my own understanding because what was the first text we read in Proverbs 3? Lean not to your own what? Understanding. But in all your ways what? Acknowledge him. That doesn't mean that I simply say, I'm going to leave it all to God. Not at all. I trust him implicitly. Claim his promises implicitly. But I take a look at all the options before me and claim with my finger on James 1.5. Verse 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God that gives to all men liberally without approach, and it will be given to him. God is a liberal. Four people fainted. God is a liberal. He's a liberal giver. He gives to us liberally, right? It's very interesting, though. In theological terms, liberals are conservative in giving to the Lord's work, and conservatives are liberal in giving. I'm not going to go there any further. I got myself in enough trouble on that one. All right, we're going back to James 1, verse 5. Here we go. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him what? Ask of God who gives to what? All men liberally without a reproach. So I'm weighing my options. I'm asking God for wisdom. I'm saying, God, help me discern the very best possible choice. Again, George Mueller, he, he talks about uh, weighing out matters. You know, here's this great man of faith who prays. And, and Mueller says this, in this careful weighing of matters, many sincere disciples fail, prone to be impatient of delay in making decisions. Impulse too often sways and self-willed plans betray into false and even disastrous mistakes. Life is too precious to risk one failure. There is given us a promise of deep meaning. Notice Psalm 25 verse 9. This is critical. The meek. I want to turn to this, Psalm 25, verse 9. We need to spend time unpacking this one. Psalm 25, verse 9. We're talking about the fact of considering your options. If you come to God with an arrogant mind and a prideful spirit, 
believing that you already know what ought to be done, and you're going to superimpose your will upon your husband, your wife, your friends, you're not going to be guided by God very much. Psalm 25, verse 9, the humble he guides in justice. Another word for humble is meek. The meek he guides in justice. It uses it twice. In the humble he teaches his way. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth. Who is God going to guide? Who, who, who is God going to guide? The humble or the what? The humble or the what? The meek. Those that come with a meek spirit. Those that come with humble hearts. Notice what it says. The humble he teaches his way. Here is a double emphasis on meekness as a condition of God's guidance. Meekness is a real preference for God's will. That's what meekness is. Meekness is the preference for God's will. Where this holy habit of mind exists, the whole being becomes so open to the impressions of the Holy Spirit. God guides us, not only at times by visible signs, but by swaying the judgment to wait before him, weighing candidly in the scales every consideration for or against the proposed course, and in readiness to see which way the preponderance of evidence lies is a frame of mind and heart in which one is fitted to be guided. God touches the scales and tilts the balance in a certain way. You know, so, so, you, so you're there before God. You're one claiming. You're, you're reading the promises of God. You believe he's going to guide you. You search the word. Is there any guidance in the word? You look for every possible option as you're exploring this deci these decisions. You're saying providences of God. Which way are you leading? You seek godly counsel. But ultimately, principle number seven. When you've prayed, when you've trusted God, when you've believed his promises, and you've sought godly counsel, and you watch for the providences of God and weighed your options, it is time to act. God has given you a mind. Make the best decision you possibly can and move on. If you keep mulling something over in your mind again and again and again, you've trusted God. You believe in his guidance. You prayed to God. You've gotten godly counsel. You looked at all your options. But if you keep mulling something over in your mind again and again, you're going to become confused. Your energy is going to be depleted. You're going to be stuck in uncertainty. Remember what God said to Israel in Deuteronomy 2, verse 3? Deuteronomy 2, verse 3. This is the Band-Aid for somebody today. Get ready to put your Band-Aid on. This is the Band-Aid for somebody today. There's somebody today. You've been circling the mountain. There's somebody today that you know that God's leading you to a decision, some decision. Maybe a decision with your finances. You've not been faithful and tithe. Maybe a decision to follow Christ in baptism. Maybe a decision to repair a broken relationship. Maybe a decision in the area of your devotional life. Maybe a decision to heal a relationship between a husband and a wife. Here's the Band-Aid. Deuteronomy 2, verse 3. You have skirted this mountain long enough. Turn northward. Many modern translations will say you've circled this mountain long enough. Turn northward. You've been going around this problem long enough. It is now time to act. It is now time to make a decision. Don't delay any longer. You're going round and round and round the mountain. It's time to move on. It's time to make a decision. It's time to move forward. Sometimes people hesitate in making a decision for Christ, but you're never going to have more light until you walk in the light you have. You say, but it's dark up the road. I don't know about that. Don't worry about what's up the road. Follow the light God has given you today. Sometimes people struggle with some habit. They delay making the surrender. It's time to move forward, time to make a decision. You have circled this mountain long enough. Sometimes people know by the grace of God they should change something in their lifestyle, but they delay. It's time to move forward. Sometimes people have major decisions to make, and they keep delaying and delaying delaying. The more they delay, the more the devil confuses them. 
It's time to move forward. It's a time to act. Satan is the hinderer. Jesus, our wonderful counselor, and our almighty God is our powerful enabler by his grace. In his wisdom, let him guide you in each decision of life. And you will discover a peace, a joy, a happiness beyond human understanding. Because you will know that you have sought God's will and you're following it. Let's pray. Is there somebody here today that you sense that God is leading you to some decision? And the Spirit of God is guiding you right now. You've been circling around the mountain. Circling around, circling around, circling around. But there's some decision you want to make. And you sense it's time for you to act right now. I just want you to raise your hand and I want to pray for you. I don't need to know what that decision is. Nobody else needs to know what it is. But you're on the verge of some decision you've got to make. Just raise your hand and I'm going to pray. Amen. Amen. If there's somebody here today that in the future, near future, you've got to make some big decisions. And you want to take these principles of guidance that we talked about today. And you want to say, God, I want to apply them to my life. Just raise your hand. Oh, my Father, we thank you with all our hearts that you divinely guide us. That we're not specks of cosmic dust on a planet spinning out of control to oblivion. But the God that created the world fashioned us and shaped us. That you know us individually. You care for us with the tenderest care. And you desire to guide us. We praise you for that. We open our hearts meekly, humbly. We don't come to you with arrogance and pride. We come to you with humility. If we know our hearts at all, we want to do your will. Reveal it to us through your word, through godly counselors, through the providence of God. And guide us, we pray. We thank you, not only that you can guide us, not only that the wisdom of all ages is in you, but we thank you with all of our hearts that you will guide us. And we claim that promise. I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you shall go. In Christ's name, amen.